A new microprocessor security vulnerability has been disclosed, known as MDS, or Microarchitectural Data Sampling. The vulnerability only impacts processors made by Intel, but every operating system and cloud vendor needs to provide mitigations to make their platform safe from exploitation. While we can't fix a hardware design flaw in software, we can mitigate its impact through updates that trade some performance in order to prevent attackers from exploiting the flaw. These updates take the form of new processor microcode, operating system patches, and guidance around the risks posed by a technology known as simultaneous multithreading, specifically Intel's implementation of it known as Intel hyperthreading technology. If this all sounds like deja vu, that's not too surprising. Over the past year, we've all grown familiar with names like Spectre, Meltdown, and Foreshadow, which is also known as L1TF. These names represent a new class of microprocessor hardware vulnerability known as a speculative execution side channel. Each is slightly different, but all exploit the fact that modern processors will attempt to speculate or guess ahead about what a program will do next. This is done to improve performance. Modern processors are so much faster than the other components inside a computer that they would otherwise sit around constantly waiting for data to perform calculations. Instead of waiting, various predictors within the processor attempt to guess everything from the next piece of code to execute to different software routines to whether a user has permission to access a given memory location they want to read. Speculation allows the processor to make the guess, keep executing, and fix mispredictions later in a manner that was supposed to be invisible. Spectre and Meltdown taught us that speculation isn't entirely invisible. We learned over the past year that there are ways to reveal the hidden state within the processor, known as the microarchitectural state, and leak it to the architectural state, that's the normal view as seen by programs. Using a technique known as cache side-channel analysis, it is possible for an attacker to infer the hidden internal state of the processor by taking advantage of shared resources within the processor. Processors feature caches that temporarily store copies of recently used data. Accesses to the cache can be timed to infer whether data is present or not. Thus, it is possible to arrange for code running speculatively to perform careful accesses to specific cache memory locations based upon the value of the data to which the code has been given speculative access. This creates a signaling channel through which data can be reconstructed by performing cache side channel timing analysis in attacker code. In the case of Meltdown, for example, a processor reaches a branch point in software based upon some condition that needs to be determined. It doesn't know yet the result of the condition, so it doesn't know which way the branch will ultimately go. Thus, it begins to speculate down the predicted path while resolving the branch condition in parallel. Later, it sees a read or load operation from a privileged memory location performed by the program. The processor needs time to confirm whether the user has access to a privileged memory location. It does this by examining operating system managed structures known as page tables. Reading these takes time. So while the page table lookup accesses take place, the processor continues to speculate still further ahead, assuming that the permission check will succeed. During speculation, all operations are tracked in a way that can be easily undone, which is known as state recovery. For example, if the permission check later turns out to have failed. But while the state of the processor might be recovered following misspeculation, the impact upon the processor's cache memory remains. Thus, an attacker is able to attempt to access a location to which they do not have access. Then, in a small window of time before the speculation is undone or killed, perform a second access based upon the first. The second access will have a detectable impact upon the state of the processor's cache, which can later be measured in order to reconstruct the value of the privileged data read during the speculated execution. Most of the speculative execution side channels we saw over the past year related to predictors built into modern processors, such as branch predictors, or those used to guess permission checks ahead of time. But there are many other optimizations that modern processors use in order to improve performance. These include various buffers and other structures within the processor used to store small amounts of data while it is being processed or while it is being loaded into the processor or stored back to external memory.
optimizations to these structures result in certain data being visible during speculation that might actually belong to other users as a result of their recent memory accesses. While this may seem to be an insecure design, keep in mind that these structures were always considered to be invisible. Collectively, the set of vulnerabilities against these buffers and structures are known as Microarchitectural Data Sampling, or MDS. Sampling means that attackers are able to see certain data that was recently processed, but not all data and not necessarily in context. For example, it might be possible to see a value of 1234 was recently read by another user, but on its own this data doesn't mean anything. Is it part of a credit card number or simply some of the digital data representing a cat video? Unless the data read literally says my credit card number is 1234, it is hard to say what this means. Thus, sampling allows attackers to get small snapshots of memory accesses performed by others, but much more effort is required to piece this back together into a picture of what the data actually means. This requires much more extensive sampling and usually also other work to provoke target programs into loading data of interest. A real-world attack might consist of targeting the encryption keys used to store web credit card payment transactions. The attacker arranges for their malicious code to run on the same processor that is also running the web server software. They then make a series of connections to the web server, all while performing periodic sampling of the processor buffers. Each time they connect to the server, it loads the encryption keys of interest. Slowly, using a series of complex techniques, the attacker is able to piece this key back together and extract it from the machine. As you can see, exploiting MDS is very tricky, requiring a significant amount of time and skill. But of course, this can all be automated by determined attackers. It also requires that an attacker is able to become co-tenant with the target of interest, meaning they must be able to run software on the same processor. There are a number of other constraints, such as being able to run on the same specific core, that further complicate a practical attack. But the attack is not limited to being on a bare metal machine. Indeed, it is possible to perform an attack from within a virtual machine, targeting the host, or from within one container targeting another. The structures being targeted by MDS are shared across all of these different privilege boundaries, meaning that any time untrusted code can be run by an attacker, Anything else running on the same physical machine could be theoretically targeted, whether this is a single bare metal server in a data center or shared processors within a public cloud. SMT introduces a further nuance. Simultaneous multithreading, specifically Intel hyperthreading technology, splits Intel processor cores into several logical processors. This allows more efficient use of processor resources. Each logical processor appears to operating system and user software very much as if it were a separate core, but actually shares many internal structures with its peer or sibling. This sharing extends to many of the structures targeted by MDS, meaning that an attacker who is able to run code on a particular hyperthread can target the other hyperthread within the same core. We can thus divide MDS attacks into those targeting single thread, same core, or cross hyperthread. As we mentioned earlier, MDS is actually a family of different vulnerabilities, each targeting a different internal processor structure. These include processor store buffers, fill buffers, and load ports. Let's take a look at each of these in turn. First, store buffers, or MSBDS. Modern processors include a small structure within the chip that keeps track of recent program writes to memory. This structure is especially important in processors that perform speculation because such writes, known as stores to the processor, may later need to be thrown away if the processor determines that misspeculation occurred. A store buffer contains a number of entries that consist of a memory address and a value. Intel's implementation of the store buffer provides up to 56 entries in contemporary cores. It includes an optimization intended to aid in distributing the structure across the processor more efficiently. Store buffer entries are split into address and associated data, each having separate bits indicating whether they are currently valid. As a result, store operations are split into two different sub-operations or micro-operations. The first updates the address, STA, while the latter updates the data at that address, STD. These two micro-operations are recombined in the store buffer into a single atomic operation, meaning that software should never see other than a valid or invalid entry. 
But because the entries are actually split, a further optimization allows the processor to speculatively forward data from a store buffer entry prior to resolving whether that entry relates to the correct address. Reads, or loads, of memory must check the store buffer in case of a recent update to the same location. To increase performance, some of the store buffer checks are performed in parallel with a potential load. In some cases, loads may be complex enough that they need an assist, meaning that the processor executes special microcoded operations internally, for example, to handle an access or dirty flag update in the operating system page tables. During the assist process, the load operation is retried a second time. Before this happens, the initial load attempt may speculatively see store buffer entries that have not been fully validated. In other words, it may be possible to see recent stores made by other users during this time. Store buffers are shared between hyperthreads, but they are also dynamically partitioned structures, meaning that under normal conditions, one thread sees one half, while the other thread sees the other half. Under some conditions, the store buffer is repartitioned between threads, but it is possible to track this in operating system software. This means that it would be possible to keep one thread from attacking another through the store buffer using some careful OS tricks. Unfortunately, there are other components to MDS that cannot be so easily separated between threads. These are the next two parts of MDS that we will discuss. Next, fill buffers. Just like processors write or store to memory, they also read or load from it. The processor will try to satisfy a load by looking in its innermost data cache, known as the L1 data cache. If it finds the data it wants, it will forward that data to any loads requesting it. But if it doesn't find the data in the L1, it must first send a request to pull the data into the L1. During this process, data is loaded into a temporary structure known as a fill buffer. The fill buffer sits alongside the L1 and is tightly integrated with it. It also includes validity bits, similar to the other processor structures we have seen. And similarly to the other structures, it is possible for entries to be forwarded speculatively. Once again, in the presence of a faulting or assisting load, an entry in the fill buffer may be provided speculatively to a load to which it does not belong. The fill buffer variant of MDS is similar in some respects to the L1TF or foreshadow attack in how it can be performed. This was indeed the way in which some of the researchers who discovered it first happened upon the idea of a fill buffer vulnerability. Fill buffers are shared between hyperthreads and are not partitioned, meaning that it is not possible to fully restrict one hyperthread from attacking another without very heavy modifications to the operating system. As we will learn later, these modifications may cost more performance than they gain. Finally, load ports. Processors contain execution units that perform the actual work of computing. These include execution units dedicated to handling loads and stores. During the process of a load, data travels through the caches and fill buffers through into the load unit. The load unit needs to support a great many different types of load of varying widths. For example, a load may be a simple, small, single byte value, or it may be a very large or wide vector. The load ports include buffers that can store the full width of any possible load. And these buffers may contain stale data from previous loads that can be made visible under certain circumstances in an attack similar in nature to that described for the fill buffer. Load ports are shared between hyperthreads, meaning that again, it is not possible to isolate loads from different threads. So how do we mitigate MDS? As we mentioned earlier, it is not possible to fully compensate for hardware flaws in software, but it is possible to mitigate them by trading some performance for security. In the case of MDS, we do exactly this. We add special software sequences that flush the internal processor buffers and other structures at certain critical moments so that any privileged data they may contain is no longer visible to an attacker. This reduces performance because flushing these structures takes time and the otherwise useful effects of their presence cannot be fully realized, but it can render a system safe from the single-threaded attack. Unfortunately, the risks posed in the presence of hyperthreading cannot be fully mitigated by a simple flush of processor state, since it is not possible to guarantee that sensitive data is not immediately reloaded by a thread. Thus, a complete mitigation of MDS currently requires that a user disable Intel hyperthreading technology, 
Of course, such a drastic move depends on the risk profile of a specific system and is only required in the case that it may be executing untrusted malicious attacker code. Thus, a system running trusted code in a private data center may not require mitigation, while one running containers in a public cloud setting probably will. Operating system and hypervisor vendors are making changes intended to provide administrators with fine-grained control over hyperthreading. For example, in the case of Linux, a no SMT kernel command line option can be used. It is possible to also restrict the situations in which SMT is disabled only to those affected by MDS. This means that automation software can still use common configuration across many platforms, including those from other vendors not vulnerable to MDS, or future Intel processors. See the documentation for details. The risks posed by hyperthreading in the presence of vulnerabilities such as MDS are real, but so are the complications presented by blanketly disabling HT. Doing so could be extremely disruptive to carefully tuned deployments, and of course has a performance impact. As a result, operating system and hypervisor vendors will not generally disable HT by default. Some OS vendors, including Red Hat, have added warning language during installation intended to highlight the general risks posed by SMT and hyperthreading technology. Administrators need to perform their own risk assessments and make a determination local to their own environment. Longer term, there is research into so-called core scheduling, which is intended to allow an operating system or hypervisor to carefully schedule hyperthreads so that they can be isolated safely from one another. But core scheduling introduces other performance challenges that may render it no better than disabling HT. As a result, it is likely that some specific use cases for core scheduling will emerge, such as public cloud VMs, while a generic solution is unlikely to ever be possible. However, research in this area is continuing in the community. Meanwhile, operating system and hypervisor vendors are shipping software updates that rely upon processor microcode interfaces to flush internal processor state. And they are providing guidance around how users and administrators can make their own risk assessments related to hyperthreading, depending upon the threat profile of their workloads. To learn more about this and other vulnerabilities, as well as recommended mitigations and remediations, visit redhat.com. Thank you.